of my heart be acceptable in your sight but father let me find my place behind the cross so that to the cross all of us set our attention amen. in Jesus name we pray amen. amen for those of you who are not familiar with the term let me explain what it means to throw shade <laughs> see to throw shade is a slang expression which means to make disparaging, insulting, or contemptuous comments about. Now, one may throw shade by words, actions, or even by one's body language. And although the term throw shade usually refers to some sort of passive aggressive insult, it can, in a sense, refer to any disparaging expression. It, throwing shade is what other generations have called dry snitching, throwing rocks and hiding your hand, backhanded compliments. Well, it's important for us to understand what it means to throw shade because the theme for today deals with that. When you throw shade, you basically try to diminish someone's perceived worth. And our theme today is building up others and helping them know their worth. Comes from this passage, this verse in Matthew 5, where Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It is a command to let your light shine. But if you go back up a couple of verses, in Matthew 14, Jesus talks about how if you have a light, you should not put it under a barrel, yeah. under a bushel. In other words, you have a light, don't cover it with shade. All right. Praise the Lord. Glory. Jesus is talking about a situation, situations we all encounter. When though we have been given a, a light, a spiritual light to shine, and though we are the light of the world, as he says in this passage, that light is not going forth. Our, our full worth is not being expressed because somebody has thrown some shade. All right. So the title of the message today is More Light, Less Shade. More Light, Less Shade. Now, you've got to understand how Jesus got to this statement about light and shade. The event in Matthew chapter 5 takes place in the early days of Jesus' earthly ministry. At this point, Jesus had faced the devil himself after 40 days without food or water in the wilderness. He had turned water into wine at a Galilean wedding. He had recruited the men who would be the core group of what we know as the apostles. Jesus was preaching and healing people all over the northern Israeli province of Galilee, but he hadn't yet gone to minister in the big city of Jerusalem. He hadn't yet turned over tables in the temple, as John chapter 2 says. And Matthew 5, 24, 25 tells us that there were great multitudes following him, multitudes from Galilee and the capitals and Jerusalem and Judea and beyond the Jordan. Some of those in this crowd that were following Jesus in these first days of his ministry were curious 
Pharisees who wondered about this new preacher, but most of them were common folk, subsistence farmers, small-time merchants, laborers, and other poor working-class people, and they weren't all Jews. Matthew um, 4, verses 24 and 25 says that desperate families from Galilee and the capital, Jerusalem, Judea, and even beyond the Jordan from the farthest borders of Syria, they came and they brought Jesus all kinds of sick people, afflicted with various diseases and torments, folks who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and they brought them so that Jesus could heal them. The ancestral land of Israel and, and the ancestral land of Syria and all the Near East at that time were under the Roman Empire's rule. And Rome did not provide health care. Right. The people who couldn't afford private doctors therefore flocked to Jesus. And by the way, church, if, if and when they cut out our newly attained health care, millions of people are going to be coming to the church because they are afflicted with various diseases and torments. In these early days of Jesus' earthly ministry, the sick and the poor came to him in great multitudes, Scripture says. And he received them, and he healed them. Soon Jesus' ministry reached that blessed and frightening point where you have more requests for help than you have space to accommodate the requests. So in Matthew 5, verse 1, says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, the multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multilingual, religiously diverse multitude that he went up on the mountain. All right. Now this was not the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was located near Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives was cultivated and cultivated and maintained as a natural amphitheater, a great city park. There were orchards and a tended garden called Gethsemane at the Mount of Olives. Jesus' ministry wasn't at that point yet. He wasn't where he could use cultivated spaces. No, the mountain in Matthew 5 doesn't even have a name. It was just some random spot out in the country where there happened to be enough wild and open space for the poor, sick people whose only common demographic was that they had been conquered by Roman invaders. Oh, and it's worth noting that, that though they were all technically living in the Roman Empire, all the folks coming to Jesus for health care weren't citizens. But Jesus made space for them anyway. Right. Not because they were properly documented and not because they could cover the copay. Mm, all right. Jesus made space for them because they had needs and he had compassion. All right. Jesus saw them. He, he really saw them. He didn't just see them as their problem. He didn't just see their status and station. Jesus saw them all at each and, and, and so he began to preach, to teach them what they needed to know about God and about themselves. You know, sometimes when people come to you with a need, when they're experiencing deep personal difficulty, we say that the last thing they need is a sermon. Sometimes, oftentimes, that is true. But sometimes, as the background of our theme text reveals, sometimes God knows that a sermon is exactly what they need. Because the world, this sinful world, never shuts up. Television, radio, streaming, podcasts, social media, billboards, emails, books, magazines, even the choices of clothing, food, and beverages selected by corporate buyers for your particular zip code. These are all ways that the powers of the systems of this sinful world constantly preach their message to you about you. The world is constantly telling you who you are and what you're worth. And if you listen to the world, you will begin to believe that you are worth nothing. In other words, the world is constantly throwing shade on your light. And when Jesus gathered these poor people together in this, in this, this impromptu space, he was trying to help them get through not just their physical situations, not just their financial situations, but underlying all of that was that their light was not shining because they were covered in the darkness, the shade that the world throws. All right. What is our light? Scripture tells us that God is light, yeah. and in him there is no 
fading. It, it, Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yeah. Romans 13.12 says that the night of this world is far spent. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light and he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The light that Jesus was talking about when he told these people, these poor people, these sick people and their families, when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, he was talking about their capacity to do good. He was talking about the fact that God had given each and every one of them and each and one, every one of us a, a portfolio of spiritual gifts. When even if we're sick, even if we're broken, even if we don't have the means to do what we physically need to get done, God has given you gifts and God has given you light and that light is supposed to shine. But it doesn't because the world is busy throwing shade. Jesus spoke to them because everybody's shade isn't the same. Matthew 5, verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, there were those who the world had thrown darkness on and made them feel like they were spiritually poor, spiritually bankrupt, that they were worth nothing spiritually. Have you ever had shade thrown on your poverty of spirit? Have you ever been made to feel like God couldn't do anything with you, like you had nothing to give to God? But of those, Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When the world throws shade, Jesus says, you are a prince and princess of the kingdom of heaven. When the world throws shade on you because um, Matthew 5, 4, you are mourning, you are depressed, you are heartbroken, you are emotionally oppressed, and you feel like you're not good for anything. When the world makes you feel like your grief is a sin. When the world makes you feel like your sadness is a sin. When the world throws shade on top of shade, then Jesus says they shall be confident. Right. Psalm 147 3 says that the Lord heals the brokenhearted. Yeah. He binds up their wounds. And yeah. Luke 4, when Jesus declared his mission, he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. And that includes healing to the brokenhearted. Yeah. Liberty to those who are oppressed. God brings life where the world grows yes. shame. Yes. In Matthew 5, 5, Jesus speaks to the meek. You know, meek is, is power under control. Meek is when you could slap them, but you yeah. never do. Meek, meek is when you could bring them down, but instead you just do your job. The, the, the culture is, is, is contrary to meekness. It treats meekness as weakness. The culture promotes aggression. But of these, Jesus says, don't let the world tell you that you have to be like the world. Because when all the aggressive folks are burned out, when all them loud folks have strained their voices, the meek shall inherit the earth. In other words, y'all going to win in the long run. Matthew 5, 6. Jesus speaks to those out there in, in, the, in the wilderness with him and says, I know that some of you hunger and thirst for righteousness, but the world throws shade on you. The world mocks you for wanting to be whole. The world says, well, ain't nobody perfect. Who do you think you are? But in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus commanded, you shall be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He says to them, when you hunger and thirst of the righteousness, the promise of God is that you shall be filled. You don't have to live with the sin you have lived with. You don't have to continue to be under the brokenness that has broken you. You don't have to stay that way. And when the world goes shade and says you can never be good, you will never be better, God says if you hunger for righteousness, if you thirst for it, then you shall be filled. And some of y'all get shade thrown because you're just trying to be nice. Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful. The world throws shade at you because you won't take revenge. The world throws shade at you because you want to be a nice human being. Yeah. The world throws shade at you because you want to treat people the way God has treated you. And, and when the world throws shade, then, then God said, blessed are you. All right. Blessed are you because you will obtain mercy. Yeah. In Matthew 6, 15, Jesus said, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. It is only the forgiving who can be assured of forgiveness. Yes, yes. It is only when you have learned to let go of what folks have done that you can walk in peace, that God has let go of all your mess. 
When you are merciful, you reflect the image of God, his long suffering, mm -hmm. his patience, yes. his grace. And in that, you can have peace. Don't let the world throw shade on your mercy. All right. All right. Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Because yes. the world will throw shade at you because you think you're too good. Mm -hmm. You lame. Mm -hmm. You scared. In 1 Peter 4, 4, it says that in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, and they speak evil of you. Have you ever had folks throw shade at you for not throwing shade? <laughs> Have you ever folks had folks get mad at you because you won't get mad? Have you ever had folks try to take you down because you were trying to mind your business and just be a decent human being? But Jesus says in Matthew 5, 8, those who are pure in heart shall see God. Because you are not stuck hearing the static of your own sin, then you can experience a connection with God that the mother shame throwers can't have. When they're walking around mad at being mad, and you walk around at peace, you can hear the Lord leading you and guiding you, and you know that your God is real. All right, all right. Because God speaks life. Yes. But the world grows shame. Yeah, right. Matthew 5, 9, Jesus speaks to the crowd and said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed and old, the world throws shade at because you don't want to get into that drama. Because you don't want to cause mess. Because you just want to live your life. Because when other people are trying to create divisions, you are trying to create reconciliation. But Jesus says when the world throws shade, God declares you shall be called the sons of God. Because you seek reconciliation and conflict resolution. Because you understand healthy relationships with your fellow man, you can recognize and walk in a healthy relationship with God. Some folks never get right with God because they don't have a context for it. They never have gotten right with people, so they don't even understand how to get right with God. It's like what John said in 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he a liar. I mean, that's the Mississippi grammar. King James says, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how? How in the world can he love God who he's right. never All seen? Right. And therefore, verse 21 says, this is the commandment we have from him. He who loves God must love his brother also. Yeah. When you can find peace in the midst of everybody else's drama, when you can see how those folks that are at each other could come together, it means you understand how to get yourself right with God. Yeah. Blessed are you. Blessed, Matthew 5, 10, are those who are persecuted mm. for righteousness sake. When you're going through what you're going through. And all you've done is what you were supposed to do. And because you wouldn't do wrong, they want to do wrong too. And, and after a while, that, that, that level of shade makes you begin to wonder. Maybe I should just play the game. Maybe, maybe I should compromise my morality. Maybe it doesn't really make a difference. But Jesus says... While they are persecuting you, God is securing your inheritance. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When they are going to be lingering and languishing in eternal fire, wondering how in the world they could have gotten to this place, you will be walking in glory. Every wrong they do to you is a right put in heaven. Every time they come against you, they are coming against the child of God. And if you are an heir of the kingdom of heaven, it means that the armies of heaven are dispatched to fight on your side. There is no weapon they can form against you that will prosper. Now, now it might hurt, and they will form weapons, but they can't win because the might of heaven is on your side. Don't let their shame kill your life. Matthew 5, 11, Jesus says, and for those of you who've been revived, persecuted, and they said all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name, you, you've been lied on, you've been cheated, you, you've been called everything but a child of God. You, he says, Matthew 5, 12, I want you to rejoice. I want you to get your praise on. I, I want you to be exceedingly glad because great is your reward in heaven. For the way they treat you, 
That's how they treated Samuel. The way they treat you, that's how they treated Moses. The way they treat you, that's how they did Isaiah. The way they treat you, that's how they did Elijah. That's how they did John the Baptist. Baby, that's how they did Jesus. And when you walk in that kind of company, when you got the same resume as the king of heaven, then that means that all of God's power and all of God's reward are pointed toward you. Don't let that shade. Don't let that shade kill your life. When they begin to throw that shade, remember the Lord you serve. When they start throwing that shade, remember that, that Jesus sees you, really sees you, sees your knees on the outside and also sees your knees on the inside. And what he wants you to do in that moment is remember you are the light of the world. Praise the Lord. But sometimes the problem isn't them throwing shade at us. Sometimes the problem is us throwing shade at ourselves. Amen. Poet Marion Williamson said, our deepest fear is not that we are now. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. And we begin to ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant? Gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. And, and the Lord answers to the poet, actually, who are you not to be? Because you are a child of God. Your, your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, but it is in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. As Jesus said, you are the light of the world. All right. But don't nobody take a light and put it on a basket. Mm -hmm. They take a light and they put it on a, a lampstand so that it can give light to the whole house. Just don't hide your light. Right. Don't, don't hide your gifts. Stop being afraid that if you step out on faith, ain't nothing going to be there under your feet. Stop letting the rest of the world tell you that you have no right to be greater than you have been. Stop letting the world convince you every time you get an idea to hush. No, nobody want to hear what I got to say. Every time you get ready to make a new move. No, I ain't never going to be able to do that. Every time the Lord calls you to step up to something. No, they don't need me. That's better folks than me. Stop hiding your life under the basket that the world handed you. You are the light of the world. The light of God shines in you. Let your light shine. Stop hiding your light. The problem is we throw shade on ourselves. Some of us have gotten past stuff we've gone through, but haven't gotten to the stuff we're supposed to do now. All right. All right. Don't neglect good works. Don't ever feel like what God has put on your heart to do is too little or too late. Do it. Let your light shine. And, and when you can let your light shine, into the darkness that other people are going through, then you give them permission and you help them find a way to let their light shine. The solution to the shade in the world is a church. To encourage each other and to inspire each other to good works, to not forsake assembling together, but to come together in the name of God and encourage each other. I see what you're doing, my sister. Keep on I'm with you. I see what you're doing, my brother. Be encouraged. I got your back. We need to stop throwing shade at each other and instead help each other to shine. When you see somebody lost in darkness, when you see somebody in the world that's covered in darkness, respond like Jesus did in the Beatitudes. See them. Really see them and help them to see the work that God has seen in them, the power that God has put in them. Let your light shine into their darkness so their light can shine too. Make space for their light. Give them room. Church, we need more light and less shade. Yeah. Yeah. Last night in my house, during the rain, the lights went out. Praise the Lord. And the darkness on the outside came in on the inside. Praise the Lord. And I got up. And in the darkness, I ran my hand along the wall until I got to the kitchen, found my way to that drawer under the cabinet where we keep 
the flashlights and whatnot. They got a flashlight. I just had that one light. But that flashlight helped me find the cabinets. Right. And, help, and, and that helped me find the, the light. And that helped me place the candles in front of mirrors in the bathroom and in other places so that when I lit the candle, the light from the candle didn't just go out into the darkness, but it reflected on itself. And, right. and after a while, it wasn't so dark anymore. And, and then I, I, I got out my phone and I almost didn't call the power company because I figured, I'm looking out the window, everybody's lights are off. Surely somebody has called and all the time I've been fumbling with flashlights and cameras. But I made the call anyway and I'm glad I did because nobody else had called. <laughs> nobody else had called. They, they, they took longer than usual getting all the information where and when. And, and after a while, though, the lights came back on. I didn't get the lights back on. Praise the Lord. I just made the call. All right. All right. Somebody All needs right. to make a call. All right. Somebody been languishing in darkness too doggone long. You, you've been fumbling around too doggone long, and you figure, ain't really no need in me calling. God don't want to hear what I, surely God got somebody else that's going to do this. Surely God got better things to do than to save my soul. Surely somebody else has stepped into that gift by this point. Baby, you need to make a call. All right. Stop, stop, stop languishing in darkness. Maybe all you have is a little light right now. Maybe all you have is the idea that, that God has spoken to you. Maybe all you have is, is, is just this invitation, but, but that little flashlight, that little candlelight is enough light for you to make a call today. You need to make the call and stop letting the world throw shade on you because some of you are not making the call because you don't think you're worth it. But you need to understand what you are really worth. You are worth so much that Jesus came to earth for you. You are worth so much that the, the God who created everything allowed himself to be contained in the small biological form of an infant. You are worth so much that he didn't just be born and leave, but he stayed on this dirty, filthy earth, getting tired and hungry and thirsty and having all kinds of shade thrown on him for 33 years for you. You are worth so much that the king of heaven died on the cross for you. You are worth so much that he fought and beat death for you. You are worth so much that he came back and stayed another 40 days preparing the apostles to share the gospel for you. You are worth so much that when he went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell you and me and every other believer so that you would never be without comfort, so that you would never be without the presence of God. And that same Holy Spirit Speaking to you right now. Thank you. Telling you that it's time to come out the shade. Yes, yes. And into the light. Mm -hmm. Come on and walk in the light. All right, all right. The beautiful light. Come on down with the dew drops of glory. Come to Jesus. Yes, yes. Come to him now. Because he's the light of the world. And the doors of his kingdom. You might have come to this place in, in your own place of darkness. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ and you walk into the darkness of everything wrong you've ever done. Come to the light. Let's stand, brothers and sisters. Maybe you've come.